decolonization is a political project, I mean a political process, but it's not only that, it's also intellectual and spiritual process. And so you can have decolonization, meaning you can have independence without decolonization. What do I mean by that? I mean that you can have a former colony into an independent state, but still colonize. In that Jamaica, you know, where I was born, is an independent country, but is it really independent? Does Jamaica control the value of its currency? No. Does Jamaica control its imports and export prices? No. Is the Queen of England still symbolically, and, 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 and I think more than symbolically, you know, um, has a hegemony ideologically over the, the country? Yes. If Jamaica is independent, why is it still functioning under a parliamentary system, not of its own making? If it's Jamaica is independent, and by the way, I'm not picking on Jamaica. I, pick a, I could pick on any other country in the world, uh, if you choose. I can, same is true for Nigeria, same is true for Ghana, same is true for Senegal, same is true for Antigua, same is true for Brazil. I can go down the list of all the countries with members of the United Nations, all 189 of them. And these are all post-colonies, including the United States, right? These are all post-colonies, right? And so they share a similar kind of feature where, yes, they are independent in terms of having uh, their own borders and, and their own names and their flags, and all the symbolic trappings of nationalism and their anthems, right? But in terms of being decolonized of the language, of the institutions, of the power relationships that was existent and prominent during colonization, they're not decolonized. And so what Nkrumah and others offered was an independent nation that had all the symbolic trappings, but allegiance, national anthem, flag, currency with Nkrumah on it, right? Coins and, and paper currencies, but it didn't have decolonized minds. People still desired British supplied equipment, clothing, and trade goods. Still desired the three-piece suit in a very hot place. Still desired the third class and used Mercedes Benz and BMWs. Still desired for mothers condensed milk, where mothers were convinced that condensed milk was better than their own genetically provided uh, milk, breast milk, right? So, the conditioning um, offered by, you know, the nationalist leaders that the trappings of and the symbolism of, of independence were more important than the decolonizing of, of the sort of the, the purging of the colonized mind, they missed that opportunity, right? Um, they fell for the trappings of nationalism, because nationalism is about nation and nation building, but I'm not a fan of nation because nations are not about people. Nation is like a, it's like a vehicle, right? The car. And that car, you know, has, it, it, it's, it's fine. It's like, a, it's like a Tesla. It has all the trappings, all the gadgetry and devices. But guess what? What happens when electricity goes out? Electricity is the people, the power source, the people. And so you can have this fancy car that's, that has all the trappings of modernity, right? It looks wonderful, that drives smoothly. But what happens when the lights go out? And what happened with lights all the people? Or the Mumba, who was formerly a beer salesman in the countryside, that's how he connected with the people, right? In my metaphor, electricity, right? That's the power source, right? That's the power base of any so-called nation, is the people. And so that's why the Mumba had to be assassinated, body chopped up into pieces and put into acid by these two, you know, German, no, um, Belgian brothers, right? So people like Thomas Sankara and, and Lumumba, um, and even to an extent Judas Inire, right, of Tang Tanganyika, who became Tanzania, they still were nationalists, but they had a sensibility about the people being, you know, taking their cues from them. And that's my argument about the people like Nkrumah, is that their cues didn't come from the culture and the fabric of, of the people themselves. So in 1957, when Ghana became, March 2nd, 1957, when Ghana became an independent nation, um, and formerly the Gold Coast, the resume for Ghana was this. Most people, the majority of the people, were farmers. B, they were non-Christian, non-Muslim. C, they lived mostly in villages, not cities. And D, <laughs> they had a desire for local indigenous institutions that regulated their lives. Even in the colonial rule, the local courts was, was the indigenous forms. 
before they went to the magistrate or the higher courts in, in, in the capital Accra or in the, um, you know, sort of provincial um, areas, right? And so indigenous forms and norms, cultural norms and predominated among the farming, non-Christian, non-Islamist community. If Nkrumah and the big six, meaning the other, you know, bureaucrats that were part of that independent movement, took their cues, that is their inspiration and, and, and their, their programmatic initiatives from that resume, you have a different Ghana. You have an independent Ghana and a decolonized Ghana. So again, you can have independence without decolonization. And what national leaders like Nkrumah did, they offered decolonization, but gave them independence, which was a fox, meaning a fake symbolic gesture but in reality, the economic, political, cultural, and religious life of the people was still colonized. I once heard you say black people need to stop waiting for another Malcolm X and MLK and look for leaders amongst ourselves. I always thought personally that the whole savior complex was based on Christianity, but it seems you blame it on Hollywood. Can you explain why? Sure. So the savior complex, um, Hollywood plays a role, but I, I want to be clear here. It plays a role as simply a part of, of, of a system. And so Hollywood is the vehicle for actualizing um, white slash European imagination and fantasy. In other words, European white fantasy becomes law. What they fear, what they're anxious about becomes law. Uh, it becomes policy, public policy. It becomes curricular. It becomes what we see and consume in terms of entertainment. And so Hollywood, therefore, is only a part of that machinery, that industry, that system um, whereby it communicates, you know, the sort of anxieties and fantasies and, and, and really fear uh, from the white imagination, right, from, from, from the white unconscious. Um, and therefore, it, it promotes and projects it, but doesn't create it. By the it, I mean the savior complex. The savior complex, you know, is simply just uh, one of several, you know, um, challenges that confronts the 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 life and death, you know, uh, efforts of people of African ancestry, right? Um, because of of the social material predicament that people across the African world, meaning the African diaspora and and, and beyond, they tend to gravitate to that complex because they need saving, according to the complex, right? In other words, when we think about Africa, we think about war and disease, right, and famine, right? They need saving. When we think about, um, you know, black communities in the United States, poverty, crime, welfare, they need saving. So the saving complex, in, my sense, in a way, is really a symptom, not a cause of itself. In other words, the complex appears because it needs to appear to justify the condition where people live in, right? In other words, you can't have a complex without that needs a savior unless you need, need saving. And you need saving because of your what? Your material and, and political predicament, right? And so uh, that's what I mean by we have to have a way in which we think about these matters in terms of systems and how systems are put together, like network together, right? So you think about network computers. You have servers, right, that talk to each other. And they have one shared goal or goals, right? Which is to communicate a particular idea, set of ideas. And so think about the educationalist industry as, 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 as one server, the Hollywood server uh, and, and, and communication server um, in terms of entertainment and, and news as, as another. And think about the political structure and systems, right? Everything from voting to policy to the rule of law, whatever that's supposed to mean as another. And you can go down the line, right? Uh, economic system, capitalism, Wall Street as another server. They all communicate with each other about one idea. This society is a white republic that should only be governed or ran by the views and values uh, that it's white and European. And therefore, everything in terms of curriculum, visuals, values, should what? Metastasize and bleed into all those throughout the servers, right? networked. And in, that, and, and in those networks where we find people of African ancestry, they need to be saved from themselves because they are the problem. Their presence is the problem, right? 
But guess what? Whiteness requires blackness, not the other way around, right? So white folks created blackness in order to justify the idea of whiteness and therefore all the other, you know, white supremacy, white superiority, all those other things are then justified. So the complex works within that network, right? They need saving for themselves. And guess who will save them, right? In other words, think about it this way. Pick any movie, any black movie, A, that's successful, A, they can't be heroes in their own stories. Pick your favorite book of literature that is about quote unquote black people or African people. You'll notice that they can't be heroes in their own story. Hotel Rwanda. Exactly. You need a, you need a white savior, right? Think about all those movies you see with um, athletes, um, the football player, for example, Sandra Bullock, right? The family is a savior, right? There has to be a white savior, right? And so you can't be the hero in your own story. It, it, it is the message of the savior complex, right? And so, but when it comes to people like Malcolm and Garvey, it works the same way, right? In a sense that these people, they function as, 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 as things that you, you can never attain, right? And, but, peop, but it also serves as the violence. How did Marcus Garvey and, and Malcolm and Martin and others leave this earth? Violently. Garvey was deported. He was a shell of himself in Jamaica, never able to reconstitute the UNIA, right? Malcolm, assassinated, right? Um, Martin, assassinated, 68, Malcolm, 64. Both men before they reach 40, right? You can go down the line. So it's those people are less about the complex than it is about if you dare try to replace our idea of the savior, this is what will happen to you, right? And that serves to basically provide two ideological forces. A, we are, you are your worst enemy and we are your saviors, right? We being this, this white, you know, archetypical figure. And B, if you dare try to provide a, a black version of that savior, this, this violence will, will be meted out to them. Meaning you can't say, the message is that you can't be your own savior. And so therefore, you know, I agree with you that yes, you know, people of ancestry should be their own um, leaders. And my, my suggestion, you start by looking at your children. Look at them. Let them be your inspiration. Don't look for Malcolm over there, or Garvey over there, or Sojourner Truth over there, or Harry Tubman over there to inspire you. Look at your children for inspiration. Do it for them and, their, and the grandchildren. I always measure success per three generations. Whatever you do, do for three generations. So the children are the, what you should look toward, not Malcolm, not Garvey. Look at the children, right? and think three generations ahead. And when you do that, you will be a leader of your family community and in a much better position than if you look towards the next Garvey, the next Malcolm. And what drives that is dogma, it's belief. And here's how you know when something is dogmatic. If you're part of a dogmatic organization and you question their premise, not disagree, but question it. Why do we believe this? And, and the response you get is not loving with hugs <laughs> and pounds and, and daps, right? That's dogmatic. These are litmus tests. If you say to your religious organization, why do we believe this? Why don't we believe that? They look at you sideways, <laughs> that's dogma. So these are small things you can do just to test, right? If you're part of a dogmatic religion, organization, community, village, you name it, right? Just question some of the basic premises or tenants of that belief, or of that organization, or of that community, or of that group. And if they respond to you, not with embrace and love, it's like, hey, wonderful, we love it. Then you know it's dogmatic.